And hello, everyone. And I'd just like to thank you all very much for coming along to my talk today. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Christo, and together with Kathy Brown, we manage the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database. Um, I'd just like to, before we begin, give a huge thank you to Kathy for her assistance um, in this talk. And I would also like to acknowledge, acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners of this land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are present. So just to begin with a bit of a brief overview of what we what I will be discussing today. I'll give a bit of a background on the history of the Australian procedures to stratigraphy, an overview of the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database and its development over many decades before finally getting into how to define a unit, including giving some comparisons on various definitions while also providing explanations of terminology. For some of you, this talk will be preaching to the converted, but I hope there will be something useful for everyone involved. So the Australian approach to stratigraphic procedures has evolved over time. Initially, well prior to the establishment of an international guide or code, we had established the Australian Code for Stratigraphic Nomenclature. This went through multiple editions since 1948, up to the fourth revised edition in 1964. Subsequently, the International Union of Geological Sciences created the International Stratigraphic Guide, which was adopted here in Australia in 1978. This guide forms the basis of our approach to stratigraphy to this day and is an incredibly useful source of information for all workers in the area. It is worth noting it is now available online at the link below and should you have any questions regarding anything in the international guide, either Kathy or myself would be more than happy to assist in helping to interpret the guide. As for the ASUD itself, it had its origins in the same era as the Australian Code for Stratigraphic Nomenclature. For those who don't know, the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database is the fundamental data set on all the stratigraphic names in the nation. In 1949, it was recognized that a unified national approach to lithostratigraphy was necessary, involving coordination between both the states and the federal government. As a result, the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database has been around for a very long time. Since 1949, when it was originally called the Stratigraphic Lexicon, and the first listings were closely followed by agreement on the need for national guidelines on naming and describing geological units in 1950. For many years, the Stratigraphic Lexicon operated as a series of card files, which we still have and which have been partially digitized. However, we have never had the resources to add all the old card file data to the digital database. So although our digital records generally go back to the 1960s, there are a number of stratigraphic units that have their origins well before this. Additionally, state lists were published between 1958 and 1974. And as early as 1974, discussions on computerization were held. In 1979, this came to fruition with the establishment of the Geological Index, Geodex, which is still the Oracle name for the database today. And although there have been several changes of platform and many database modifications and enhancements over the years, the, in 1994, the first external access to the database was completed and database development continues to this day. As for the WHO of the ASUD, as mentioned earlier, it is operated by Cathy and myself. Um, it is done so by Geoscience Australia on behalf of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission, which is a subset of the Geological Society of Australia. Um, in addition to the permanent staff, Cathy, who is the national convener of the Stratigraphy Commission, and myself, the ACT convener, we have two part-time contractors, Tegan Beveridge and Lee Cassells. And it is important to note as well that there is a stratigraphic um, convener for each state or territory in the country. And I've provided contact details for everyone at the end of this talk. The database today records some 18,212 names, which are considered to be current. That is, they are still in broad usage by workers across the country and have not been superseded or rendered obsolete. Of these, 4,958 have been given a proper definition by the authors 
and 5,171 are either fully described, that is the category beneath the definition, or described, which is the category beneath that. However, as you can see of the total of 55,564 total names recorded in the Strat Units database, the vast majority are not current names. Some 37,352 names, which will be a combination of superseded, obsolete or misspelled names. However, it is also worth noting that all of the information in the Australian Stratigraphic Units database comes from some 16,894 index references, ranging from maps to explanatory notes to journal articles and other major publications, etc. As for how you can go about accessing the ASUD yourself, you can do so through the GA website at ga.gov.au and clicking on the link here in red on the front page. This will then take you to an information page with additional links and helpful information. And if you click on stratigraphic unit search, it will take you to the search page. As you can see, you can search via a range of criteria from dates entered, reservation period, name, state, province, etc. It is also worth noting you can use wildcards in the name search. And here is a bit of a typical example of what comes up when you do a search. As you can see, the database holds as much information as possible regarding a particular unit from things such as the lithology, province, maximum and minimum thickness, where applicable, unit relationships, age and use on maps, etc. We also have a link to the definition cards of units that have been defined, and we do our best so that the forward facing information you receive is the best available understanding of each unit. It is also worth noting that it is possible to obtain downloads of all stratigraphic names within a state. That concludes a bit of my brief overview on the ASUD, and now we will move on to how to define stratigraphic units. So to begin with a bit of a definition, primarily today we are dealing with lithostratigraphy, which is the element of stratigraphy dealing with the description and systematic organization of rock bodies into units on the basis of lithology, applying not only to sediments, but also to igneous and metamorphic units. As most geologists are aware, it is the observations that you make in field mapping, which are the basic data that form subsequent interpretations and data compilations. So it is fairly easy to understand how important it is to get the lithostratigraphy correct, especially as the fundamental data is collected, that is collected is reused and reinterpreted for many years to come. Our other work is in various data compilations and data sets at numerous scales. Ultimately, what we are doing by formally defining our stratigraphic units is ensuring we are getting this foundational data correct in the first place. This is so that we can create a permanent record of our science to be expanded upon for decades to come. Conversely, if we haven't defined a stratigraphic unit, it can create confusion. And the unit can actually morph over time, particularly in its lithology. And ultimately, what the original worker meant by a particular formation can become totally lost in the process. So truthfully, we do this because we want to eliminate any confusion and enable more robust science, not just for ourselves, but for the broader community. It is worth noting then that a minimal definition will always be superior to no definition at all, as a defined unit has recognition and formal priority. As for how to actually go about defining a unit, once a new unit has been decided on, the following steps need to be taken to define it. A unique name has to be chosen for the unit. This must consist of a geographic name plus either the dominant lithology, such as sandstone, or a rank term, such as formation, group, men, group or member. The, a geographic name cannot be used for more than one unit in the same or an adjacent geological province. In non-adjacent geological provinces, the same geographic name may be used if the ages and lithologies of the units are sufficiently different so as not to cause confusion. I'll explain later on the procedure for checking the avail availability of a name and reserving it. A type section or type locality must then be set up. The type section is at the heart of the definition since there must be a representative section or area where someone can go to see what is typical of a defined unit, including important features such as unit boundaries. 
We then complete a unit definition form and use the headings provided as a guide to help you describe the unit as best as possible. The definition must then be approved before publication and the completed definition form should be submitted online or sent by mail or email to the stratigraphy subcommission for the state or territory in which the type section or locality of the unit occurs. Once the definition is approved, it is lodged by the convener of the subcommission with the central register of the stratigraphic index, where it is available for general reference. Publication of the definition is the essential last step. However, it is worth noting that just by completing the definition form, your unit will count as having been published via the Australian Stratigraphic Units Database. This does not have to be additional work on top of the work you are already doing. So here we have the ranking scheme and units at formation level may use the dominant lithology in the name rather than the word formation. Inclusive igneous units always do this. Um, it is also worth noting that lowercase b beds are an informal way of naming it very poorly known unit. These are a hangover from the Australian Code of Stratigraphic Nomenclature. When we moved to the International Stratigraphic Guide, some state surveys changed all their beds to formations while others progressively renamed units as they became better known and could be properly defined or abandoned. So now that we have a bit of an idea of the ranking scheme for unit names, we can move on to the name reservation procedure. But the Australian Stratigraphic Names Database should first be searched. Ideally, you are looking for a unique name tied to a geographic feature. If the name is found in the database, it has been previously published and it will not be available for your unit if it occurs in the same or an adjacent geological province. The local state or territory stratigraphy subcommission may also be asked for advice on the availability of the name. Under certain conditions, abandoned names may be reused, but there must have been a long enough time gap and limited original use for a name to be resurrected. If the above searches do not locate any prior usage of the proposed name, you should complete the online unit reservation form accessible via the ASUD website. If this is not feasible, you can contact us via stratnames at ga.gov.au, providing the same amount of detail. If the name is preempted, the author is invited to submit alternatives. Where there is room for doubt or a judgment is required, please contact the national convener of the Australian Stratigraphy Commission, in this case, Cathy Brown. If the name is available, it is reserved for five years for the author, who is asked to follow the guidelines for the definition of a new unit, complete the definition form and obtain approval for the completed definition from the relevant state or territory stratigraphy subcommission member. If no suitable geographic name is available in the area, it may be possible for you to propose a name yourself within reason. Once you have named your unit, the next step is to set up a type section or type area. That is the type section, type locality or type area, the stratigraphic is an essential part of the definition of a lithostratigraphic unit. Without it, others may not be sure of what exactly the unit is supposed to be. Whereas if you have a proper type section set up, if there is any uncertainty about what defines a unit, inspecting its type section should be able to tell you. Additionally, without a type section, the unit is invalid and has no official standing or priority. Other workers can refuse to recognize an invalid name. And although in practice, when such a name has become widely used, it is often in the best interest of the science for the invalid unit to be validated by publishing an appropriate type section or area. It follows that there can only be one type section for any stratigraphic interval. If two or more type sections are set up and it later turns out that there has been a miscorrelation, how can anyone know which one is meant to represent the real unit? A properly set up type section is also very useful for geologists new to the stratigraphy of an area for examining a typical example of the unit. There is therefore no point in having a type section that no one can look at it must be generally accessible. Usually type sections are set up in areas of well-exposed outcrop, but if, as in the case of subsurface units, they are defined in drill holes, the drill core must be held in a place where any geologist can come and see it. 
As for the essentials of a type section, once again, it must be representative of the unit. It should have the typical lithologies and boundary relationships of the unit. Ideally, all the lithologies of the unit should be present. Although they are commonly not all present in a single section and supplementary reference sections elsewhere may be needed. More discussion on this later. Good exposure is required. Usually the best exposure of the unit without structural complications is selected that also meets the other necessary criteria. Many units do not have 100% exposure anyway, anywhere, so their type sections have to take advantage of the best available exposure. The type section should, if possible, include exposures of the contacts. A boundary should be based on a single point in a section or locality. Accessibility to all who are interested is essential if the type section is to fulfill its role as a standard of reference. For example, don't specify a type section in prohibited areas, such as a closed Aboriginal sacred site or in physically inaccessible areas, such as halfway up a sheer cliff. Drill core type sections must be available for inspection by any geologist. There must additionally be a reasonable assurance of long-term preservation. Don't choose areas about to be submerged or covered over, mine or quarry facies that will be destroyed, or areas that will be built over. For non-stratified units or for some very poor exposures of stratified units for which there is no alternative, a type locality or type area has to be chosen instead of a section. Should the main type section not cover all aspects of the unit, supplementary reference sections may be set up. So how to set up a type section? First off, choose a, choose a section that meets the requirements of the essentials of a type section as on the previous slide. Record the latitude and longitude of the base and top of the unit in, in the section, which may be a single point, as in the case of a cliff section. If the section has any offsets, the coordinates of the start and finish of each leg must also be given. If only a type locality or area can be specified, a single coordinate will usually suffice. Others must be able to find the location and be in no doubt about the exact position. You may need to describe how to get to the section and a map or photograph showing the location might be necessary. Grid references may be given as well, but by themselves are not sufficient. Grid systems are not international, they have changed in the past and can change again in the future. Latitude and longitude, on the other hand, are internationally understood. Think long-term when defining a type section and consider succeeding generations. Then we measure the thickness of the unit in the section wherever possible, or at least estimate it. This is not required for igneous intrusive units. We then describe the lithologies of the strata in the section or the rock types present in the type area in enough detail for the unit to be clearly distinguishable from adjacent ones. Measured columnist sections and photographs may accompany the description, but are not essential. The distinguishing or identifying features that justify separating the unit from adjacent ones must be clear. Sometimes this will be obvious as a markedly different lithology or an unconformity, other times it will need to be spelled out. We then describe the relationships and boundary criteria with adjacent units. This includes conformable, unconformable, faulted or intrusive relationships, how the boundaries with underlying and overlying units are recognized and why they were chosen. Fossils, if present, are essential to the description only if they are diagnostic or noteworthy component. Detailed species lists are not required, but may be given. The degree of detail necessary will vary from giving only the phylums present to naming particular species that have crucial stratigraphic significance. Other non-essential but desirable elements to include in the description, <coughs> where applicable and known, are the structural attitude, the geomorphic expression, depositional environment, and diastems or hiatuses. It is worth noting that the type sections of groups, 
subgroups and supergroups are the composite of the type sections of the constituent units. They do not have separate type sections of their own. The type sections of members are defined in the same way as those of formations. Often a member will be defined sometime after a formation has already been established, but if it is defined at the same time, the type section of the member does not have to be in the same locality. The member may be geographically restricted and not present in the formation type section. However, if the member is present in the formation type section, the latter section must include the member even if the type section of the member is somewhere else. As for reference and replacement sections, in some cases, the type section does not contain or expose all the significant features of a unit, particularly if the unit varies geographically. Where necessary, supplementary reference sections or localities can also be specified. Reference sections can be set up at the same time as the type section or later in the region of the type section or elsewhere. These sections remain at all times subordinate to the type section as the standard for the unit. If a top or bottom contact is inadequately exposed in the type section, a better exposure of the contact at a reference locality elsewhere can be designated as the boundary stratotype. Rarely there may be cases where the original type section has been destroyed, submerged, cover, covered over or otherwise made inaccessible. If the accessibility and long-term preservation criteria are taken into account when the type section is chosen, this risk should be small. But it has happened in the past and a re replacement section can be selected. The International Stratigraphic Guide differentiates between various kinds of reference and replacement section. For more information about these, read about the stratotype section in the IUGS. Revisions of type section. Sometimes advances in knowledge may require changes to the definition of a unit and its type section. An example is the discovery of a significant unconformity within a defined unit. Such revisions require as much justification and the same kind of information as for establishing a new unit and generally involve the same procedures. So having chosen a name and set up the type section, the next stage is to fill out the unit definition form. Having set up the type section properly, you will basically have filled in all of the compulsory fields necessary for the definition card. So shown here is an example of the definition form showing all of the relevant criteria. It is worth noting that the downloadable form also includes advice regarding what needs to go in each field. The, there are the basic requirements, as we've previously discussed, things like name, state, new, new revision, um, unit history, et cetera. But, and it is also worth noting, once again, for a group, the type sections of the constituent units are used. It is important as well to say what is uncertain or not known. For example, the maximum thickness of a unit may be uncertain due to likely structural repetition. Desirable but not compulsory criteria include expanding all the type section headings to include variations found elsewhere in the unit, uh, such as variations in lithology, thickness, significant fossils, uh, um, additional relationships and boundary criteria, etc. cetera. Uh, things like geophysical expression, alteration and mineralization, all of these things are optional. And once you have filled in the form and it has been approved by the convener of your state or territory and supplied back to us, the definition counts as having been published via the ASUD. At this stage, your definition is now official and has standing in priority. You do not need to publish a separate article or paper beyond filling out the definition form. And it is worth demonstrating that it is possible to have minimal definitions. In this case, we have the Christmas Creek member of the pool sandstone from Western Australia. It features only the required fields and many are simply one sentence. This shows that on a base level, defining a unit does not have to be a tremendous task. Obviously, more information is always better, but you can get away with bare bones definitions, which are always better than no definition at all. 
Now, in an ideal world, the idea would be get to the stage we see here for the Joe Voice Granodiorite. Both the required and the desired fields are fully filled out in detail. We have modern, up-to-date coordinates and extensive references. This would represent something close to the gold standard for a definition. However, we recognize that reality is not ideal and for most units, this may not be possible, just owing to things like time constraints on work, poor data or poor outcrop of a unit. So really, once again, I'd like to reiterate, it is better to have any definition than no definition at all. You can always add further information later down the line, but if a unit is not in, defined in the first place, your meaning of a unit may become lost over time. And just a bit of a demonstration of revisiting units for redefinition work later, should you or subsequent workers find out more about that unit in particular. Here we have an example of, of a unit from Western Australia the Charterist Basalt, which still features a very bare bones definition. It is in need of modern usable coordinates. Age and evidence could be improved since the age here is only inferred from a stratigraphic position. Despite there being more modern information on this unit, there has been no formal redefinition, which would be strongly encouraged in cases such as this. And to give an example of a unit that has been redefined, here we have the Deacon Volcanics, now, this unit initially had a very bare bones definition, quite similar to that of the Charteris Basalt, until being redefined in 1990, vastly improving the understanding of the unit. It is worth noting that in doing a redefinition of a unit, you need not redo every single field. All you have to provide us is what has changed since the previous definition. And that concludes. Um, my topic on defining stratigraphic units. And just for a final note, if you are unsure about anything regarding reserving a name, setting up a type section or defining a unit, the conveners are all here to help. And I would recommend getting in touch with them at any stage of the process, should you have questions. Thank you all for listening and please feel free to ask any questions while I go through the last slides, which are just a collection of where to find further assistance.